We're recording. Um, so welcome um, to um, this semester's topical class uh, 450. And I see uh, many familiar names. So first of all, you don't have to turn on your camera just in case someone, you know, um, do not have a very stable internet or do not have uh, enough bandwidth. Um, and uh, um, so in class, I'll use uh, pose sporadically to just do some sanity check. Sometimes it's anonymous, sometimes it's not anonymous. And uh, for example, the first one, so let me do a anonymous and anonymous, you know, poll. Um, so for example, uh, we'll see some uh, um, anonymous poll right here. Um, and we'll have some non-anonymous poll. I, let's say uh, we just wanna check if everyone is on the same page. Um, and uh, um, first day of class. So first I wanna apologize because uh, I'm kind of super lazy procrastinating. Actually, I prepared um, our Canvas class space like until maybe say 10 minutes ago. So right now it should be uh, online. And uh, uh, so various resources link should be available. So if you were in math 449 last semester, uh, you know, you should be familiar with, thank you for doing the poll. Um, so uh, you should be pretty familiar with what is like in our class. Basically um, we'll do lecture and uh, uh, sometimes when we reached a certain, let's say milestone, uh, we'll go through some possible coding uh, related to uh, what we have learned. Um, so today, uh, first let's review, let's review uh, 449. First of all, the 449 is of course the uh, prerequisite for this class, but uh, let me still review it, but from a very, very global picture, a very high perspective of what it is like for 449. So. And uh, if you have questions, so don't hesitate to message me in the chat. So I've always got my chat window open. Um, so in the first half, um, we learned iterative methods. The iterative methods works as follows. Um, we perform some sort of operation iterations by iterations. So for example, if we have um, X is a vector and this is our, this is our N plus first, uh, we call it iterate, okay? So this N plus first iterate is obtained um, through some sort of a relation, for example, a function G acting on the last iterate. So this is the nth iterate. Okay. And in generally, and we hope, so what we hope is when we let N go to infinity, we hope, this is what we hope. Okay, it's not guaranteed. So we hope this one converges to a fixed point. And this is like, uh, this is, uh, okay. So this is a, the point of uh, what we would like to have. For example, a fixed point or whatever. And and the convergence is in some sense, which we'll review if we have time in the last part of uh, today's class. So for example, if it converges in two norm, infinity norm, whatever. 
But this is the generally a theme of uh, iterative methods. And if we want convergence, at least we should have one thing. Like I said, this is from a very high perspective. So a necessary condition for this convergence is iteration after iteration. We want our iterate converge to the fixed point. A necessary condition is um, our next iterate, okay? At least should be a better iterate than x sub n. So when we perform one iteration, the approximation to x star, okay, the quality of this approximation improves. And keep this in mind, this will be a constant theme of our class is after iteration, we should see improvement. So this is the theme. And then we are in the second half of, uh, uh, so in the second half of uh, last semester, uh, we learned optimization. So optimization is essentially, um, we're looking for the minimizer of a function. So we're looking to minimize of a function. And of course this function satisfy uh, certain conditions and we want to find its minimizer. And this minimizer, normally it's a local minimizer. Um, so a method we can use is called a gradient descent. which I'll write down the simplest form is uh, given the initial guess we can iteratively obtain So this is like the simplest one, but we, we learned many uh, variants of uh, this gradient descent last time, for example, the steepest descent uh, where alpha uh, changes every time. And we learn conjugate gradient descent, which uh, our search direction consists of uh, many directions and we do a line search. So, and, but this is the simplest one. Okay, so, and this is a function of uh, basically um, X uh, sub N and we, if we want to add, we may add, this is also a function of its gradient, okay? Um, the idea is every time, every time we apply this formula, okay? So under certain assumptions, every time we apply this formula, we should see, we should expect our iterate, okay? So our iterations, so let's say, um, is closer to the minimizer than the previous iterate. And this is, this, is a, this is a big picture of uh, what we have learned last semester. That is iteratively, we're getting better and better iterate in terms of its distance to the uh, uh, minimizer. So uh, let me add, um, is the uh, minimizer. 
Okay. And this this also will be a constant theme of uh, um, this uh, semester's, like, uh, you know, this semester's theme. So we apply um, iterations of iterations of method and, uh, um, and we just expect like uh, our approximation to the minimizer gets better and better. And this will be a theme. So also right now, so I will launch a poll. Uh, this time it's an a, a non-anonymous poll and uh, uh, just basically a sanity check poll. And uh, um, so we should usually expect to like, we'll have sporadically occasionally uh, this type of poll uh, during uh, the class. So if I see a majority of you guys uh, having trouble with certain uh, proofs or ideas, I will stop and uh, go back to, thank you um, for the polling. So I will go back um, to certain material and uh, uh, go through it again. So a warning is we will, we'll like, uh, you know, last semester, we'll see lots of proofs and also we'll see some coding, but... Um, Okay, so this this is like a review of uh, Math 449, but from a very high perspective. And the next question, okay. So next question is how we can apply the optimization we have learned in machine learning. I mean, I'm sure all of you guys have heard the term machine learning because um, I mean, it is arguably the most commonly used and overused buzzword in the academia right now, I guess, or let's say in the IT in general, in the science community or whatever. Um, so, the answer is, I mean, optimization is used everywhere, but, uh, um, but how it is used. And then before we answer the question, how it is used, uh, we have to uh, answer the question. Uh, what is machine learning? I mean, if you Google the question, Perhaps uh, you will get uh, like a 10 million answers and uh, you know, maybe a million video on YouTube. And the short answer is this is machine learning. Okay. But what I'm trying to say is uh, I'll give you guys an example. Okay. So the example is, uh, is actually uh, about calculus. Okay. So imagine the following. Imagine we're writing a computer program. So we are designing a computer program to solve calculus problems. So for example, um, So we want to design, let's say we want to design a bot to solve calculus problems. I mean, if I'm, if I'm telling you that we can do, you know, we can use machine learning technique to train a bot to solve calculus questions, you know, you may be very happy because uh, you will do the homework for you, but I guess all of you guys have already taken calculus. So, um, so that this is, uh, you know, maybe a late good news, but uh, imagine what we do before the era of big data. 
So what we do is, uh, so let me, and by the way, uh, for this class, uh, for those of you who were already, who have already uh, taken my 449, like I said earlier, um, my recommendation is do not copy um, the notes for, uh, like uh, during the remote meeting. So just listen to my babbling and listen to me talking and uh, I will always upload uh, the lecture notes on the canvas. So you can check uh, the canvas and also the cloud recording. But uh, I highly recommend you do not take any notes during the live stream. So, um, and the traditional way of uh, uh, designing this uh, robot to solve calculus problem is we program like every theorem, literally every theorem in calculus into this spot. And, uh, um, and then we categorize Categorize. We categorize the problems. Okay. And uh, we write many if then. So, so for example, we write this type of code if uh, the bots see, let's say, problem type A, and we apply theorem, let's say B and et cetera. Okay. So we do many of this kind of things. And let's, see what happens if we apply a machine learning model to this problem that uh, what we say is we say we use the word train maybe too many times okay so it's also an overused word but i will follow this trend so what happens if we want to train a bot to solve calculus problems, okay? If we wanna use data-driven approach is we do not program any theorems, any explicit method into this bot, okay? So instead we let this bot See, we only let the bot see two things. The first one is problem statement, okay? And solutions, okay? So if enough problems, if this bot um, has seen enough problems and enough answers, and we just hope this bot can come up with an answer whenever it sees a new problem. So th this is a machine learning, okay? And uh, the problem statement is called features, or we can generate features from um, the problem statement. And the solutions are called labels or targets. So what happens is we hope, we hope we let this bot see enough problems and answers, then it can come up with solutions to calculus problems on its own. So it's pretty much, it's very similar. So this machine learning procedure is very similar to preparing for exams, okay?
I mean, how how do we do? What do we do to prepare for exams? We do practice tests, right? So the train procedure, okay, is essentially we do this practice tests. Let, let me use the exam because tests will resolved later, okay? And next step is normally we call it validate or test. So now we have do we have done enough practice exam. Uh, so we'll put ourselves in the trial that we we just test our knowledge against something that we have not seen before, and it's the actual exam. Okay. Even though, even though, so here is the key of why machine learning works. Why machine learning works is because we assume, we assume the actual exam is similar to the practice exam, okay? I mean, even though I'm using this kind of a seemingly you know, absurd example to do analogy, but it has some deeper mathematical meaning. So uh, is similar. To practices. Okay, so for example, if some instructor, some professors uses drastically different actual exams than the practice exam, I'm assuming you know, I will be mad at it at least because I have done, you know, so many practice exams, but only to find the actual exam is totally different. So, um, so this is an assumption of how machine learning works. All right. And uh, um, okay, now th this is the example, but uh, let, let me, let's do some uh, abstraction. So if we, uh, if we look at this example, what uh, um, we see is we're preparing for exam, right? We're humans. So uh, for machine learning, we need normally, what I'm saying normally is there are some old school models that does not need a model, okay? So um, that's called instance learning, but we're not interested in that. So, uh, we're interested in uh, like uh, the model-based machine learning. So for a model, in the preparing exam uh, uh, example, uh, the models are just us, okay? So, um, okay. Prepares. And uh, uh, in, so now we're ready to tackle the mathematics abstraction. So mathematical abstraction of the example above. That is how do we prepare uh, for exams? So first we have a model. And uh, for example, in this model, um, actually it has a name. In statistics, we normally say, okay, if we have a model, we sometimes we have a hypothesis. So this model, we, uh, we have a function. So we just call it a function, which is H. And it has an input which is a vector X and it has parameters and we call it W. So let me add. So the input, the input, this is the input, whoops. So this is the input of 
the model function. Okay. And the W, the W are called the parameters of the model function. And uh, um, we give this a name, we give it a name, we call it a Y hat. And this is the output, okay. And what we hope and what we are trying to achieve is What we're trying to achieve is y hat is a good approximation to what is called the ground truth. and the uh, y, okay? And this y can be a vector, can be a number, and can be a probability distribution. But here I'll just use the scalar um, to simplify the presentation. And this is what we're trying to achieve. So let me give you guys a simple example, okay? So suppose I have an image of a cat. So for example, if I have an image of a cat, um, okay, so this is like an image of cat and abstractly it can be represented by a matrix X, okay. And it, so the label is, let's suppose we, we just want our model to tell whether in this image there's a cat or a dog. Okay, so for example, and the label, or say the target of this, uh, um, of this image. So X is a matrix representing this image. And the Y, Y is like cat, okay. So what happens is for this label, the probability of Y equals cat given this image is one, okay? And, uh, um, and the probability of y equals dog given this image is zero. So this is a mathematical abstraction and we can, so abstraction, is X and our label is, let's say the first component is one and second component is zero, okay? So then a good machine learning models and say a good machine learning model and we give the image, this X, so we feed this capital X, which represents this image as a matrix. So we feed this X to the model, okay? So for example, and then this model will output two numbers. So again, um, 
this is the parameters of our model. Okay. It will output two numbers. So for example, if it outputs 0 0.95 and 0 0.5, I'm sorry, 0 0.05. And what does it mean is it's an approximation to the true label. So this is y hat and this is a y. And y hat, we want it to be an approximation, a good approximation to the true label. So this is what we try to achieve. If we have a bad model, we may have 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Okay, so that will be a bad model. And if a good model, we will have something like this. So for example, it predicts, okay, our image has 95% of a chance to be a cat. I mean, intuitively speaking. So this is a, this is a good model. And the question is, how do we achieve that? So how to get such a model? So this is the next question we try to add, try to answer. And the answer is we optimize what is called a loss function. So I won't go into detail into the mathematics, we, which we will in the future, but uh, today we are trying to like paint a big picture from a higher perspective. So what is the loss function and why we wanna optimize it is because loss function. So it is a function characterizes the following thing. It characterizes the difference of the model's prediction, the model's output y hat to the ground truth, which is y. So the loss function characterizes such difference. If we optimize to be precise, we wanna minimize this loss function. And what does minimizing the loss function do is if we minimize the loss function, we minimizes we, we have minimized this difference, okay? The difference between models output to the ground truth y. So what we do is we trying to minimize this difference. So we want our models prediction, we want our models output as close as possible to the ground truth, okay? So what minimization does is so minimizing the loss, what does minimizing the loss do is, uh, um, is we make the models output as close as possible. Um, why I'm using as close as possible is because normally we cannot achieve 100% accuracy. Uh, we can only do as close as possible most of the time um, because this is subject to the model's representation representation capacity. 
So we want to make the model's output as close as possible to the ground truth. All right. And this is how optimization theory we learned from last semester plays a role in the machine learning. So eventually every machine learning problem, like a model-based machine learning. So will be converted to an optimization problem. Okay. So, and, uh, um, and let's recall like uh, uh, the theme we have earlier the iterative method right here, okay? Why it's called learning, why it's not a machine learns, why it's called a machine learning, it's because this process, this procedure is, is a learning procedure, is constantly happened through iterative method. So it's very similar to this. After every iterations, so right here. So for example, our models parameter in M plus first iteration. Okay, we apply some certain optimization technique we learned um, last semester is equal to a function, let me call it this function g, and the model's parameter in the nth iteration, okay? We build an optimizer to perform um, the following thing so that after we apply this iterative method, at the M plus first iteration, we'll have a better model than the previous iteration. And why we say the better in quotation is because uh, the loss function is smaller. And what does loss function being smaller translates is because the loss function measures, characterizes the difference between our output and the ground truth. So the optimization of this loss function, like we learned earlier, if the loss function is smaller, it means this difference is smaller, okay? And the difference is smaller, meaning our model represents our data better. So that's why we say it's a better model. And this is a very, you know, like a global picture from a, a higher perspective of how the optimization is applied uh, in machine learning. So in the last part of uh, today's class, okay, um, I will review uh, some, uh, so some notations because uh, not uh, every one of uh, you guys have taken uh, 449. I mean, um, if you have taken 449, I mean, you can leave right now because um, the rest of the class, I will review some common you know, notations which we have used constantly uh, during uh, 449. So the first one is norm. Of course, the first one is vector, okay? So for example, uh, we have a vector x and uh, normally it's an rn meaning uh, x has n component okay and then we have what we have is norm the second one is norm um, so a norm of a vector 
uh, if we don't have any soft script, so this is norm of X, norm of X. Um, if we don't have any subscript, it just means two norm. So what two norm means is uh, it is um, the square root. Let me let me use this. So the square root of uh, x one square plus x two square plus till n square. So we take the sum of the square, then we take the square root. Okay. So in general, we'll have uh, uh, p norm. So this is defined as x1 to the pth power, x2 to the pth power, uh, plus xn to the pth power. And then we take one over uh, pth power, which we take pth uh, root. Um, but this is, uh, this is uh, most likely will restrict ourselves in the two norm. And then we have a norm. So um, this is a vector, right? So then we have matrix. So normally if we have a matrix A, uh, we write A in the, sometimes it's M by N matrix, but uh, in this quarter we'll actually learn, I'm sorry, in this semester, we'll actually learn A can be a rectangular matrix. Um, so actually last semester, the matrix, the problem we saw are quite nice. So this semester we'll tackle some simple problems like least square and such. Um, and the matrix can have norm as well. Okay. And this is called a, a induced norm. So And uh, uh, whatever, so whatever uh, P here, the P norm here, it is uh, the supremum and we can think this as max. So uh, we can replace this as max. So the supremum of uh, V in Rn, so let's consider the first case, okay. Such that A multiplied with V, uh, the P norm divided by V's P norm itself, okay. So induced norm, this is induced norm. And, uh, um, and normally we just write down something like this. So V in Rn, and this is A times V, um, two norm and V two norm, okay. And then we have infinity norm. So these are P norm. So for example, then we'll have a vectors infinity norm. So a vector X uh, infinity norm. And this is also commonly used. And this is a maximum of I between one and N of each component. And similarly, we have matrix induced infinity norm, but uh, um, that is kind of confusing because uh, actually later we'll try to indu uh, introduce another um, F norm, um, which, so we will not use like a matrix infinity norm, this notation in our class, but uh, there is one. And to avoid confusion, so I will not go through that. And, uh, um, and the other important notation I want to review is inner product. So the inner product between two vectors. So for example, X is, uh, let me use UV. Okay. So U in RN and V in RN. The inner product of the two is, or say the dot product is simply we just uh, sum up um, the component wise uh, product. And notation wise, notation wise, the textbook uses this notation. So the textbook likes to use two notations. The first one is U transpose V. Okay, 
So you transpose V, this is like, a, um, so if you in Rn, we normally rewrite U in this way. So U2 and uh, Un, okay. And U transpose is uh, a row vector and multiply with V, a column vector, essentially is uh, we sum up. So this is matrix vector multiplication. Essentially it's uh, this row times this column and then we get a single entry. Okay. And the textbook also uses this notation, which is uh, the angle bracket, which is U comma V, okay. And you guys will see in other literature, uh, this, uh, you know, parentheses notation. So parentheses U comma V, and this denotes the inner product of uh, U and V as well. And lastly, you should recognize the dot product, okay. So U dot V is the inner product as well. So uh, this is for today's class. And on Wednesday, uh, we'll start, you know, to learn some optimization theory and uh, together uh, some simple, like a simplest machine learning model called a multi-layer perceptron. So that's it for today. If you have questions, you can, uh, you can leave here. I mean, you, you, you can stay on, on Zoom and ask me questions. So I'm gonna stop the recording right now.